All right. Uh, well, this comes with a sound. That one comes with a sound example, so that's especially good. Let's talk about the changing meaning of noise. And um, I'm going to say something. No, you can all later tell me something that annoys you about academics, because this is going to be fair. Because I'm going to tell you something that annoys me about sound artists now. Um, there's this thing people do where they say, okay, I did something noisy, and so it was transgressive because it was noisy. You see it in artist statements, you see it in performances, you see it in theory. I don't actually think that's true. And the reason I don't think that's true is because noise has become, whatever you think noise is, has become a normal part of the functioning of modern life. And this is, in fact, not just true sort of socially, it's also true in engineering. So for years, engineers knew that you know systems created noise. You make a long distance phone line, um, all this sort of electrical interference creates noise, can't hear the person on the other end. Obviously the way to deal with the noise is to get rid of it. That's the solution. Um, and in a number of different fields between the 1950s and 1970s, people started changing their minds and saying, hey, maybe we can make this noise useful or maybe we can hide the noise underneath the signal in the communication system. So I'm going to give you a couple sonic examples of this. Um, the first is the dentistry example, just because it's dentistry. And who thought the history of dentistry was interesting? So in uh, the 1950s, this guy, J.C.R. Licklider, who does a, did acoustics research, um, has a cavity. And he goes to his dentist. But he brings a white noise generator with him. And he puts on the white noise generator and says, drill me. Don't give me any anesthetic. Just drill me. And they do it. And the guy's like, that didn't hurt at all. So then... Um, the dentist goes into his office. This is actually in the article. I'm not making this up. Grabs his secretary, who quote has a fear of den of of like dental procedures. Why you would work in a dentist's office? I don't know, but she did. Brings her in. They drill her out. She's like, oh, that was fine. And so he publishes this article called Audio Analgesia. And the idea is that the white noise provides a kind of pain relief. And so I've created a sonic simulation of this. Um, so you can feel it. It's a little bit upsetting. I'm just warning you now, like, <laughs> if anybody has, like, a, what's the word? If this is a trigger for anybody. Uh, you've been warned. You're about to hear a dental drill. Okay, you get the idea. So the idea is partly that some of the pain isn't, is, is uh, synesthetic, right? It's in a reaction to the sound of the drill and the noise actually masks it. And so this may be the social origin of Muzak in dentists' offices. I don't actually know. But this was happening in a wide range of fields. So in architectural acoustics, uh, they did the same thing, where they began with, um, uh, they, they, they said, well, we have, all this, we, we have all this noise that we need to get rid of in offices, especially as middle class offices were moving to open plans. So where people used to be in offices, then they're in cubicles. Well, now you're hearing all the other people in the office. What do you do? So um, a number of acousticians said, well, you use things like the HVAC, which you can hear if we're all quiet for a minute. In fact, I... I, that was the sound I heard the most during Brandon's presentation. He kept saying, listen to the voice in your head. And I'm like, isn't that thing like making a ninth? I hear a fundamental and I hear a ninth. Um, so it's a, it's a um, you, you make that a lot louder and then you can't hear across the room anymore. You can just hear the person next to you. And so I also created a, a um, uh, a uh, demonstration of that. Oops. That's not what I want. I want this. Okay. So you hear all this background noise. You're working in an office. People are on phones. You hear all this noise. Then the music comes.
I tracked down actual Muzak for that. So what it does, what it, by adding noise to a noisy environment, you actually reduce the phenomenal space around the uh, listener. And I think I have illustrations to go with this somewhere. Um, no, I have boats. That's not what I want. Uh, so, the, so, so you actually reduce the phenomenal space around the listener. It goes from hearing across the room to just hearing what's next to you. And uh, the result is noise becomes incredibly useful. So uh, Leslie Doel writes this book called Environmental Acoustics and says this is basically how we should build stuff. If you want, if you have a noisy office building, open the windows or pump sound in from outside or install a waterfall or do something where the noise actually masks the other sound, hides the other sound. Now this becomes an engineering principle at Bell Laboratories in the 1970s. They're trying to do this thing, they're trying to build this thing called linear predictive coding, which is sort of what your mobile phones do, uh, but it isn't going very well. The idea is basically how, what's the least amount of speech we can transmit down a phone line. In other words, a computer can predict what you're gonna say not very well, but let's say a computer can predict what your speech is gonna sound like on the other end of the phone line. You put a computer at each end of the line, and then the first, running the same program. First computer predicts what you're gonna say. It, then you say it. The computer says, oh, well, I was wrong by this much and in these ways, and all it does is transmit the error to the next computer down the line. That's super efficient. Doesn't really work, but it's super efficient if it did work. And so they were working on this linear predictive coding technology. It's super noisy, very difficult um, to hear anything and to hear anything clearly. And the engineer said, you know what? Rather than trying to get rid of the noise because the process is generating all this noise, what if we hit it? What if we hit it underneath the signal? What if we use the signal to hide the noise in exactly the same way that the white noise hid the drill? And so that's what they did, they, and they ran some experiments, and this became the principle on which eventually perceptual coding was developed. The first thing perceptual coding was used for before, increasing, before it was increasing signal efficiency was hiding the noise created by the communication system itself. And so if you look at the last 50 years of the history of noise, a lot of what's been going on has been about putting noise in its proper place rather than noise being this radical transgressive thing. And I say this as someone who reads Jacques Attali and loves that shtick, um, but I think, it's, uh, I think it's somewhat disingenuous today to say I'm making something noisy and it's radical and transgressive and that's why. So um, the portable people meter, um, uses the same principle. Portable people meter is an audience measurement device that you wear, it's a meter, you wear it, wear it on your person, hence portable people meter. Um, Arbitron uses them and several other people, several other audience measurement companies do because nobody can figure out how to measure internet traffic or who's watching what or whatever anymore. And so they thought, well, why don't we measure ambient media? In other words, you walk by a billboard, you go to a bar and hear, um, hear music, instead of you reporting it, uh, what if we just had an inaudible signal in there that the ear can't hear, but that the microphone on this meter can hear? And so you'd walk in, so they'd get every radio station in a market to sign up and put a little box in their studio that transmitted a signal inaudible to people. And they couldn't do a high signal because that annoyed dogs and cats. So they had to do it within the audible frequency spectrum, but in such a way that it was masked by the musical signal. But of course, uh, microphones don't have the same limitations as human ears, they have different ones. And so you put a microphone in a device and a digital, little digital signal processor in there, and the device can literally hear things that you can, and it can say, ah, so and so walked into the bar at five o'clock and this song was playing, they heard this music, they heard this advertisement as a way to generate knowledge about audiences and ratings. Um, and so it's become a way for media to talk to one another about what we're experiencing without us experiencing it. Okay, um, I'm about out of time, so uh, I guess if you have other questions or would like to tell me what annoys you about academics, we can do that uh, at the Vernissage at five. Thank you very much. <laughs>